we're at. We're in Council Bluffs, Iowa, at Joe Atkinson's layout here. Beautiful layout we've got here, and we're here to talk about the Iowa Interstate locomotives that came out from Intermountain. We're going to do a review here on his Iowa Interstate layout, and since he's an Iowa Interstate guy, I figured it'd be no better time to show you a little piece of his layout and review these locomotives. So let's get started with the review of the Intermountain ES44AC and the Iowa Interstate Rock Island Heritage Scheme, the regular Iowa Interstate Scheme, and we'll also show you the CSX Scheme of these locomotives. Let's get started. So here we have the Intermountain Iowa Interstate locomotive. We're going to unbox it. I usually unbox it for the first time, but these were ran ahead of time because before driving over here to Council Bluffs, I wanted to make sure we were good to go. But I did not have any issues out of the box the first time it was unboxed. No broken parts. There were no issues running it. So the locomotive is pretty well good to go. Now that we've got it out of the box, you've got the handrail protectors will get out of there and that's literally all there is for packaging from Intermountain. There is a quick manual, reference manual at the bottom of the packaging and that is about it. So there's the Rock Island unit out of the box. Now we'll get it on Joe's layout and see how it runs and reacts under DCC control. Usually in a review I start with detail if you want an in-depth detail, well, you can go back to my review of the Intermountain ES44AC, the last run, which happened to be the Norfolk Southern Heritage Units. But we will cover some main detail. First of all, these locomotives are equipped with etched metal windshield wipers, you can see there, separately applied grab irons. I will try to zoom in for you guys a little bit here so you can see some of the detail. But you've got separately applied grab irons all around. Sand filler hatches are present in the front. You've got clear windows. I personally like to see a little tinted windows, but I haven't really been able to talk anybody into it yet. You've got the MU hoses with the silver painted tipped ends. Not only are those MU hoses painted with silver tipped ends, but you can actually see some three-dimensional difference between the actual main plastic part, indicating those connections on those MU hoses. You've got the ditch lights, which are present. They are functional on the front, on the rear. They're functional as well on this Rock Island unit. However, they do not flash in reverse. And we'll get to that later as well. You've got the metal coupler here. I believe it's a KD. I can't remember what number. You've got the stanchion, which is nice. And definitely not too flimsy. It holds up pretty nicely, the stanchions and the front handrails. You've got the nice white safety treaded colored stairs on the way up to the front. You've got the window and the cab door, all those separately applied grabs, obviously LED nose headlights versus uh, the ones in between the number boards. The number boards are lit as well. We'll get to that later. <clears throat> Working our way back to the cab, you got the cab window shade. You have the satellite dish, or satellite, not satellite dish, but the satellite unit up top, the cab shade, the windows, and the actual little mirror detail. IAIS513 is the cab number. It's clear legible. I see a lot of warning labels that I looked at under a magnification previously that are legible. You've got, as we move along the side, a lot of the vent detail <clears throat> as you work towards the middle of the locomotive. Obviously, this being the Rock Island Heritage Unit, you see Rock Island up in nice, bold, white lettering. You've got the side handrails, which are also very sturdy. I don't see any problems with those. None of the stanchions are popping out of the holes or anything like that. You've got the fuel tank detail with the angle of these two fuel tank components here and obviously the nice detail on the trucks. <clears throat> Working our way towards the back where the radiator fan gr grills are, you've got that nice separation. I'll try to zoom in even more but we're probably going to lose focus here. Nice separation of the radiator fan grills on the back. They are three-dimensionally above the body of the locomotive and that's accurate for the prototype. They really did a nice job of modeling that. I think it's really nicely done and nothing like I said no parts or anything are coming off. We did miss the exhaust right here. There's no flash or anything 
left over from the mold on that, so that's nicely done. And working our way to the back of the locomotive, got some of the same with the metal coupler ditch lights back here. Oops, Joe's gonna kill me. And just nice detail all around. On the other side, I'm gonna refocus here. More of the same detail, nothing special. I just wanted to show you pretty much a 360 degree view of the locomotive. But you've got the three fan grills there, more separately applied grab irons, and a lot of the same detail that you come to expect from Intermountain. I think they've done a pretty good job. As Joe mentioned earlier, I think they've stepped up their game in their locomotives and pretty, pretty impressed with this. And being not too far from Iowa Interstate Action, I think it's a nice representation of a road that's not modeled too much because it's a smaller road in the U.S., but they definitely have done a nice job. All right, let's go ahead and move into operation, which all of you guys like. We will fire this thing up by uh, hitting F8, which handles the prime mover sounds, and let you hear it. So ESU does one of the best jobs I've seen of both the warning bell starting the locomotive up, kind of the struggle of the engine to get woken up from that cold slumber. I think they really do a good job. This locomotive is still kind of going through some of the sounds of the startup of the locomotive, and you can hear how it's it's basically now started up and ready to go. Now I do notice that one of the wheels is off track here. But this is uh, LED lighting, but we're going to go and listen to the bell, which should be F1. And the horn, F2. We've got some other sounds as well. F3 should be the uh, coupler clank. F4 is dynamic brake. Interesting, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but on the locomotives, on the prototype, the dynamic brake housing is right around here, and it almost sounds like that's coming from that area, but I don't know how intentional or unintentional that is, but it sounds pretty good. Um, F5 is just number board lights, which I will change angles to show you guys. F8 turns the primer, prime mover sound on and off. F9 and 10 we can uh, manually notch up and down. Now that Joe and I have changed angles on his layout, <clears throat> what you can see here is the number boards are lit um, by F5. Ditch lights are lift, lit by F6 and the headlight is obviously F0. Now when you blast the horn, should be flashing ditch lights on this. We'll check that out. Yep. So there's the flashing ditch lights. I believe with some CV tweaking you can change the frequency of those to a slower or faster flash rate. I think it's pretty quick out of the box, but uh, it gives you a good example of the ditch lights. Now the rear ditch lights, I'm not going to waste time showing you, but they are illuminated. However, they do not flash in reverse. That's because of a limited decoder function capability. They can't offer the flashing ditch lights on the reverse ditch lights. You've also got the rear headlight. All of these are LED lights, so very good job by Intermountain on that. Unfortunately, kind of limited by technology and decoder capability on able, being able to create those flashing ditch lights in reverse. Well, that gives 
a good idea of the sounds, now I think we're going to go into operation a little bit. So I'm going to move this camera to handheld mode and we're going to go around the layout a little bit in a section. And allow you to see different speed steps from really slow crawling, see how it reacts under different speed steps from DCC command on this lens system that uh, Joe's using here on his layout. So we're going to go ahead and put some lights on for you, ditch lights, number boards, and headlight. We're going to run through how this motor operates. So we're going to start at one speed step, which I've already verified it does crawl pretty smoothly at one speed step, but we're going to go ahead and move to that here. You can see the excellent motor control of the ESU decoder in these locomotives. Now we're going to go ahead and kick it up a notch quite a bit here. Kick it way up. So great motor control. And that is the speed and precision of the ESU system in the Intermountain unit. Well guys, that about wraps up this review on the Intermountain ES44AC and the Rock Island Heritage Scheme. We're going to cover some final thoughts before we let you go as this locomotive pulls in for its final stop here on Joe Atkinson's Iowa Interstate layout. So just so you guys can see a couple different schemes of this Intermountain ES44AC, you've got the CSX unit here. This is obviously the new logo for CSX. I think it's How Tomorrow Moves is their new slogan. It's the new bracket logo. So you can see that nice vibrant CSX blue and yellow with the white top, nice antenna detail, which is different on each type of locomotive. It is road specific. So this CSX antenna detail is different than the Iowa Interstate detail because obviously the prototypes vary. But there you can see just some of the differences on these locomotives. And there's that other side of the CSX. And then we'll cut over to the traditional Iowa Interstate scheme and let you see that. And then I promise we'll wrap the review up. The last scheme I want to cover is the classic Iowa Interstate scheme, traditional, whatever you want to call it. It's the standard Iowa Interstate scheme, but it's really nicely done. Again, maybe I'm easy to please, but I think they did a really good job on this locomotive. You've got the front, which actually has the Iowa Interstate logo, and the back number boards, plain yellow. You've got the yellow MU, I mean the yellow coupler cut levers and all the yellow accents along the side. So lots of schemes for Intermountain. We still got the UP5000 GVO unit coming out from Intermountain next month. Regular UP late model GVOs which will have that late model distinguishability on the radiator fan grills and other late model differences. All those are coming out I believe in November, at least that's the plan. But I wanted to show you guys the schemes that are available now. So Joe, I don't know what you think, but I think we should probably wrap this review up of these guys have seen all the schemes and let you guys know some of our final thoughts, including Joe's 14 years of modeling experience. You can chime well, in. Well guys, well. sadly yeah. this wraps up my visit to Joe Atkinson's amazing layout. He's done a lot of great work here in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and the end of this review. Now for an MSRP of $289.95, for sound and $199.95 for non-sound. I think it's a good deal, especially for the discounts you can get 
at some of the retailers. I know trainworld.com has some great deals. I know other online retailers offer some great deals. So be sure to check those guys out to get some of the best discounts available. And also be sure to visit your local hobby shop and support those guys. But again, I think it was an amazing locomotive. Great detail. The ESU sound is amazing. They've come just leaps and bounds in this industry, made great progress. Lots of great sounds on the startup and shutdown, great motor control, great detail, durability. Not really a lot of negatives I can find on this locomotive. I'm a window tent freak, but other than that, I can't really think of anything. But Joe here, do you have any thoughts being an Iowa interstate modeler on your on this locomotive? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Anything you see, um, pros or cons on this locomotive? Uh, I guess I just have to say, modeling the Iowa interstate for, for the last 14 years, I have uh, gone from the early days when any Iowa interstate modeler had to do everything from uh, uh, from from undecorated, and you're you're painting, you're doing all your own your own detailing and everything. Uh, but these Intermountain models, I I have to say, I was just super impressed with the level of detailing and the quality of the details that are included right out of the box. I, I really couldn't think of anything that I would would add to them uh, to uh, uh, run them. In, with my own uh, with my own roster that that I've spent uh, uh, in some cases you know months on a particular unit uh, detailing and painting and so on but uh, uh, it's really a, 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 a giant step forward I think for the Iowa Interstate modeler. Cool so yeah Iowa Interstate like I mentioned is one of those roads that's not well it's not widely known it's a local road to the area pretty much so having that available for the modelers is awesome and I think it was a great service for Vendor Mountain to do that. Again, you saw the CSX logo, you saw the Rock Island Heritage in the classic scheme, and then they've got the UP ones coming up shortly. So lots of different schemes to choose from, that amazing ESU sound. Guys, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I think Joe, you guys always talk about, you know, I'm a young modeler. Joe's been around a little longer, and if he's impressed, then I think that pretty much covers it. <laughs> Thanks for watching, Joe. Thanks for having me to your layout. Amazing layout. I enjoyed having you. If I can, you know, go to my dying day having a layout like this, I think I'll be a happy man one day when I retire and can settle down somewhere. But we may be back for a layout visit one day because this guy's layout is amazing. He does amazing work. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time right here on my channel. Take care.